Hey everybody, this is Mario Dennis, your host for the Keeping It Real Estate podcast, and today I have my good friend Sean Frank with Mainframe Real Estate. How are you doing, Sean? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me. Of course. Um, for those that don't know um, Sean, and if you're listening to this elsewhere, you're going to find this to be a very interesting podcast because Sean and his partner, John, have been able to do something that is very different. And we were talking about this a little bit beforehand, which is generally, you know, you have boutique brokerages and then you have your large franchise brokerages. And when people are thinking about technology, they're thinking about large franchise brokerages. But you guys have been able to create proprietary in-house technology for your agents as a boutique outfit that is incredibly impressive. And I felt like that was a good point to start. Um, tell me a little bit about your company, your mission, and then we can get a little bit into the, the tech that you guys are putting together. Sure. So I've been licensed for about 17 years now. I got in 2002. Um, broker's licensed in 2009 and ended up opening this office, uh, which we started under a different company name and we rebranded to Mainframe Real Estate in 2016, but opened the office in 2012. And specifically, I opened the office because I... I was techie, I, I was developing tech, but I was working all by myself and I realized that I had to either go open an office or stop tech development. And so I chose to open an office, you know, 28 years old, out of a recession, go get a downtown storefront lease. It was a little crazy to, looking back at, you know, just the idea that I was like, I can go do it. Yeah. <laughs> so, um, um, you know, and, and so I think we were, we started on the tech side before anybody else did. You know, I would say it probably was only like two or three years ago that all in one platforms was even a discussion. Nobody was talking about it before that, but we, st we started conceptualizing it seven years ago and the platform we've been working on now for the last five years, we just started ahead of everybody else. And, um, and the thing I think that is our greatest advantage is that we've had the opportunity to learn what really works, what's really needed. And these bigger companies are creating software and just hope that the agents like it, that it, that it works for what they intended it to. And we've just been, uh, we've been, we've been growing it slowly, getting feedback and making sure that we're actually developing a platform that, that makes sense and it's practical. Um, so we've, you know, and that's just a small piece of the puzzle. I mean, we, uh, you know, our focus is really on agents that do high volume because we want to provide technology that helps them be efficient, organize and process more transactions, um, in a, a more streamlined manner. And in uh, just by having by focusing on more top agents, we were able to provide better services because a lot of brokerages that hire, you know, mass quantities like most companies are. That's their goal. Hire as many agents as possible. But then you can't really give everybody quality service, you know. And so we've gone a little bit of an opposite direction in terms of focusing on high level services for top agents. And, uh, and it's it's the hardest part about that whole thing is creating a reputation for having an office of top agents, um, which takes time and you can't even, I mean, I guess you can buy agents, people proven that you can do that, but you know, we want to, we don't want to force people to come over that, you know, that wouldn't otherwise, we want to have such a good value proposition that they see why they would be able to do more business or do better by coming to our uh, mainframe. So. Um, what got you started on the tech side? Because like real estate and tech, like you said, I mean, it's, it's, it's all the rave for the last mm -hmm. two years. Um, and I think m partly it's because agents have started to realize that they're getting clubbed upside the head mm -hmm. by tech companies. But before that, it wasn't, it wasn't something that was a very symbiotic balance between tech and real estate. Um, what got you started into tech? So I think it was just the, the, the sheer fact that, I mean, I was always on a computer. I mean, like I was doing graphic design when I was in middle school because I just thought it was fun. Like, you know, Windows computers are so bad, you have to fix them all the time. So I was like, I was a master at fixing broken computers because <laughs> <laughs> now we have Macs, thankfully, and they're well adopted at this point. But um, I was just always very techie. Um, and, you know, when I got into the business, my first job was I was an assistant at an office. And I mean, wow, technology, like, like 17 years ago in real estate, there was no e-signing. Like l literally there was like carbon copy contracts and people were, or they would take paper and put it in a typewriter and type it, or they're doing it by hand. And I saw a lot of the things that 
were happening then. And I was like, oh my gosh, I know there's a better way, but these people are not going to be the ones to figure it out. And so, you know, you can only do so much. You're, you're, you're kind of confined by the tools that you have. You know, there, uh, there was no e-signing platforms then, but, you know, I think it was in 2009 or so that the iPad came out. Mm-hmm. And then I was figuring out, well, how can we do wet signatures on iPads and, and, and those sorts of things that were just ahead of its time. And then specifically in 2011, I started developing 3D tours. But it was, I mean, if you went back to 2011 and typed in like 3D real estate tours, you wouldn't find anything. A virtual tour was a photo gallery, right? So um, that was the real first piece of technology that I developed was 3D tours, like having panoramas, being able to walk from room to room. And then that was the catalyst to open the office. But then when I opened the office, it was like, wow, now we need a back end system. <laughs> and so that's been our fundamental focus. I mean, for the last several years now and just um, working on specifically something that's transaction management related. Yeah. One thing when I saw the preview that you guys launched of your tech is having been in the large companies. One thing that I noticed is it's very hard. There's two things in the technology world that I think are very hard. First is chasing your competition. So I think that's problematic for some of the bigger companies that are trying to chase now, say a Zillow, for example, that's been around forever, trying to like, like you say, honing and developing and mastering their tech and someone is trying to chase them that down. I think that's very difficult. The other thing that I think it's difficult is for very large companies that have agents, you know, different states, different countries across the globe to create a tech that's meaningful to a great bunch of those agents. Because like you guys have said is, you know, you have decided that you're going to cater to the agents that are higher producing agents because you feel that that provides, you're able to provide those agents with better service. And that's, that's a very, um, that's a very commendable decision that you guys make that, leaves revenue on the table Mm -hmm. for you guys, but you're making that decision because you're truly invested in wanting to provide more for those top producing agents. And, and the technology available right now that I see elsewhere is mostly catered to the opposite. It's mostly catered to the newbie agent. It's trying to create as much, as many safety nets as possible um, for agents to be able to um, get started in the business sooner rather than later. I totally agree. So a conversation we have a lot is the 80-20 rule, right? So 20% of the agents do 80% of the business and 80% don't do that much. You know, and unfortunately, I think part of the reason we're so dedicated to, it's not even just about working with top agents. They provide the best service for their customers. The agents that are doing one or two deals a year are making tons of mistakes and costing people money. Um, so we don't really want to even be associated with that either, <laughs> you know, but, but what I, we say on, go ahead. And I don't mean to cut you off, but yeah. the thing that's crazy about that is, like you said, the race seems to be for agent count. One, mm-hmm. one of the most meaningless stats, I think, that gets touted in real estate. I, don't, I can't even believe that people spend the time creating flyers on Facebook posts about agent count because it's truly a meaningless statistic yeah. or a transaction-based business. So if you're not generating transactions, you can have 10 million agents. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make a difference. But companies seem to love to have those agents why why well i look at if looking at the top companies in our market probably every market they're just quantity based i mean if everybody's paying a monthly fee and they're not doing anything it's the gym mentality that they're making membership yep they they're the companies are making money with agents that are literally have full-time jobs doing something else you know or when they do close a deal they're you know they they're going to be at a split that it or some kind of compensation where it makes sense for the brokerage, you know, but I mean, in, in my opinion, quantity and quality are inverse. The more agents you have, the more problems there that they're going to have because you can't have that many great agents. It's just not possible. But back on the tech side of things, we, you know, we talk about what the 80% need, the 80% that don't have the business. They need lead gen, they need lead conversion. They need, you know, marketing, all that kind of stuff, which every, every agent needs that, but experienced agents, their phone's just ringing. They don't even have to market their referral base, their word of mouth. And so top agents need contract to close. And so I feel like a lot of the companies now are focused on lead gen, conversion, drip campaigns. It's all CRM based, um, which is fine, but it doesn't get a deal done. And so we focus on the tech that gets the deal done. What, what do agents need from contract to close? And we, we focus more on that process because 
agents that have high volume, time is their number one bottleneck. If they don't have the time, they can't get that next deal. So we focus on trying to make it so that they can have more time and more organization and not have so many components in so many different places. You know, when we, every time we talk to an agent, we're like, where do you do this or that? And everything's in a different software. They're band-aiding things with spreadsheets or not doing like juggling in their head or not doing anything at all to have a system in place. So we try to help agents provide those. We pr like to provide those solutions to those agents so that they don't have to go reinvent the wheel all the time and try to figure out how they're going to manage their business. Cause most, most brokerages don't provide a really comprehensive contract to close process. And I feel like a lot of the companies out there that are focused on tech are not focused on that either. The thing that is interesting about transaction management is that leading up to contract, there's nothing, there's nothing solid about that process. You're nurturing relationships, you're showing properties, whatever else. There's not, it's, there's not deadlines and all this other stuff that happens once you get under contract. Once you get under contract, it, from a technology standpoint, it has to go step by step by step by step by step. And you cannot have a step go out of order or get in the agent's way. And I think that's one of the things that bigger companies are going to struggle to find out how to do on a tech side is walk an agent through the entire transaction without actually causing more problems for the agent. Because that's why I feel like doing it on a grassroots level like we're doing, we're getting detailed feedback about what works, what could be better. And so we're doing a really fine tuned transaction management. You know, that's just a part of the software, but that we're really focused on that part because doing that step-by-step -step getting feedback from the agents, we're building something that's very robust and it makes sense in the real world. And I think a lot of technology is created to be so generic that it doesn't have a lot of those benefits. I'm gonna apologize for the audio. There's someone mowing the lawn downstairs. And so for a few minutes, you may hear a little hum, the hum in the background. Um, but um, back to your point, so the race technology wise, you're, you're dead on. It seems to be who can get to the lead first, who can generate the most leads so that they can get referrals or sell them or whatnot. And what you guys are doing is you're saying, we trust that our top agents have that part figured out, meaning mm -hmm. they've, they didn't become top agents by accident, at least not the vast majority of them. Therefore, they probably have a follow-up system that's robust enough and a networking system that's robust enough to continue bringing them those leads mm -hmm. that they're working with and for their referral network to continue to increase. What you guys are saying is that top agent, once they go on their contract, is where the real mayhem begins mm -hmm. because it may take them away from doing other things if they don't have a robust transaction to close system. And man, the transaction to close systems suck right now. Oh, like they just, they they're do. awful. They're awful. And the transaction coordinators are awful. I mean, I, you know, obviously I'm drawing a big blanket over, you know, some people that may be very good at what they do. But in my experience doing this for several years, working with several transaction coordinators, it is, it, it, it's very difficult to get a transaction from the beginning to close without having to, at some point or another, explain to s one of the parties, like, hey, we're trying to accomplish the same thing here. Mm -hmm. Like, let get out of the way of the transaction. We're all trying to get to the same thing here. Um, so it's really interesting that you guys are not even chasing the lead generation side. Or not. Well, you know, I think that one of the biggest um, fallacies in our business now is that well, first of all, let's start with there's more agents than ever. And there's more people trying to sell those agents something than there's ever been. <laughs> so, so those agents are getting a lot of empty promises. And I feel like when it comes to lead gen and conversion, let's, let's be honest, agents don't like it to pick up the phone. They don't like to do follow up. They want a system that's going to call people, follow up, nurture the relationship and spit it out when it's ready to write a contract. And it's just not simply the case, but I feel like that's the, the silver bullet that everybody's hoping or thinks that exists out there. And we really honed down over and over and over again. It's about relationships. It's about who you know, who, who likes you, you know, how, how many people like, and obviously your network builds as you grow your real estate business, the referrals, but that's what we focus on is referral or relationships because in referrals, if you have that part down, especially, and it takes years to do that as an agent, then you don't have to worry about all this really intense lead spend, lead follow up, chasing strangers, you know, just to try to get business. Like you have people call you and say, I heard you're the best. I can't wait to work with you. Yeah. And, and the silver bullet, like you said, the silver bullet, everybody chases is it's that system that's going to give you 
just the buyers that are re ready, willing, and able to go look at a house and write an offer today. And, you know, truthfully, that's, that's, that's just that. It's, it's a silver bullet. It's, it doesn't really exist. And if it did exist, it doesn't do the thing that, that it's going to promise that it does. But, but it, there's not enough emphasis on the back end. And so that's why you see agents all the time, for example, agents in gigantic brokerages that are paying gigantic fees to be in those brokerages having to, having to do something like buy a, not a separate system, mm -hmm. like a follow-up boss. Because, for example, no one in, in their company you know, thought of the idea of having to do lead routing properly or a proper follow-up follow and accountability system for lead routing, which I think it should be one of the most essential things on any kind of CRM lead-based system. Or companies that, that have a system that, it, that, that may um, account for the lead generation in the website side of things, but it doesn't talk to their back-end system and their contract management. So you end up having to have three, four, five, six logins for every single day course of business. I mean, like, if you think about it, there's people logging in to the MLS, logging in to DocuSign for signatures, mm -hmm. logging into a different system for their CRM, logging onto a different system for their back back agent, back flow type, you know, that that's, I think, pretty standard for the industry. You know, and that's where we're trying to alleviate that, you know, it, it other than being that's re, that's re, like redundant data entry, it's room for error, but it's also hard to train people in multiple pieces of software, you know? So we've really focused in on our side, you know, we don't have that, that lead follow up and all of that. We're going to integrate with CRMs that can do all those wild text campaigns and everything else that, you know, it's the interesting thing about a CRM is that as much as agents want it, their agents are generally speaking, not very good at keeping their database up or when they have a conversation, they don't put that in their CRM. So most CRMs are complete, like as soon as you enter your whole database, it starts becoming out of date immediately because most agents aren't that admin. There's no side. maintenance. There's yep. no maintenance. Yeah. You almost need an assistant to run a CRM for you because it is really time consuming. Well, and, and I've had Matthew Wheatley on the podcast and he, he's a broker and he, he made a decision that he doesn't do a separate CRM. His Facebook is my CRM. You know, Facebook, you know, he feels like if he's going to touch his clients, he's going to do it through Facebook. If he's going to add people to a database somewhere, he'd rather just add them to his Facebook. You know, there's an, you know, I don't know what the percentage in the United States is, but probably over 90 percent, 95 percent of people and at least one person in the household has Facebook. So he does mm -hmm. that and he runs his campaigns and quite successfully, if I may add, because at least there is an ongoing activity taking place, whereas... Mm -hmm. To your point, you may have the coolest CRM software stashed away somewhere, but if it's not continuously being updated, not only with new people coming in, but also with new outgoing content, they're worthless. They don't. They don't. Mm -hmm. they, they don't do anything for anybody. But even they're like, you know, agents want to. They think, oh, how nice! I can go behind the screen, click send, and I'll send a thousand emails. I don't have to talk to anybody. But you know, everybody <laughs> knows that that was. They, would, they were mass communicated to, it's not authentic, you know, and you just, it's not personal. Like picking up the phone or texting and hey, I was thinking about you, how's it going? Like that's how people really get business. They don't, I mean, yes, you can get it in email campaigns, but people want to believe that you care about them. And, you know, there's just too many realtors out here now to take a passive approach to it. Sure. You have to really harness the strongest relationships because there are a lot of realtors hungry for business right now. Yeah. And, and I feel in our industry, there's a lot of bursts of success of small technology. And so the, mm -hmm. the probably one of the more recent ones that I can point to was the um, get a free home valuation. Like that became the catchphrase of everybody and everybody started using it and everybody would have like a squeeze page out there, you know, that people could enter their address and get a free home valuation. And that became um, very effective. And then, you know, th after that, it became the systems that do the mass texting, mm -hmm. you know, the, from uh, whatever, you, you would give it a number. And so it, it would send a text from that specific number that if they respond, they came back to your phone. And so you could send a, hey, how are you doing? Thinking of you text message to 300 people. And so then that, that became the next text. But what happens in our industry is that stuff gets abused. Mm -hmm. Because first of all, there's so many people that tout themselves as teachers and coaches that don't have any meaningful, tangible information to give their students. 
that anytime any new piece of tech comes out that may have even mild success, it gets pushed out there like the next greatest thing. And so then it gets overused and then the consumer catches up to it and then other industries catch it, mm-hmm. catch up to it. And then I'm getting six text messages every day from companies trying to sell me health insurance in the same manner. So like those bursts of tech, like the home valuation thing or the mass text or whatever, like that lasts for such a short period. They have such a very short shelf life become before it becomes obsolete and and you're found to be a fraud in you know if nothing else and so again to your point it it really requires a team of people that are continuously doing that you know that touching in a meaningful way you know talking to people having real conversations visiting them at their place of business doing the things that will make you know will develop those connections i always say you know, my customers generally will come back to me because I, w- I talk to them so much and I text them so much that they see me in the grocery store. Like, you know, I would hit them with an avocado upside the head if they listed their house with someone else and they yeah. know this. And so that's kind of the relationships that, that you build in the industry that I think um, are probably the one thing that can never be taken away. Mm-hmm. You'll, no one's going to take that away from you. I totally agree. I think that the... <laughs> what most people are going to do on any topic when they're interested is they're going to go to Google and they're going to start there or they're going to go to Zillow and start there. But that's what you would imagine. Like a lot of people are going to do that even if you have a strong relationship, but what you really want is that they'll be like, they'll think, Oh my gosh, I'm thinking about buying or selling. I'm going to call Mario, you know, because then I can get a real person on the phone to really give me a consultation, help me out, get me started on this process. That that's the best case scenario is that you cannot you have such a strong relationship that they don't even hop online and start falling down those funnels because every website has a funnel for them to fall down, <laughs> you know. Yeah, and one of the recent one of the things that has worked for me personally is I've made m- people around me know and understand that I love talking about real estate, like mm-hmm. I love it, like it's my job, and so it's good that I get paid for it. But it's truly something that I would do even if I didn't get paid for it. Like for me, houses, investing, you know, figuring out neighborhoods, developments, like that's fun for me. And so one of the things that's happened to me is I've been able to get a lot of people to bypass the funnel because when they reach out to me, they no longer feel like they're, you know, burdening me with a question. They feel like, oh, this is going to tickle him, you know, like, mm-hmm. so they, they are like, hey, Mario, what, what do you think about buying a beach condo, you know, and, I'm, you know, they wouldn't otherwise do that, but because they know that I have fun with this stuff, um, it, it's, it's made it, it's made it permissible to reach out to me at any time uh, to talk about real estate. Mm-hmm. I think it's important. Um, what are some industry trends that you are seeing now um, that you have any feelings about like do you (laughs) whether it's whether you feel like it's detrimental or it's good for the industry or um makes you lose sleep at night well i mean i don't really lose sleep about anything that in terms of disruption i really feel like it's our responsibility to be able to adapt and if we can't then we should be doing something else because this industry you know as much as it didn't change for the longest time. It's starting to change and mostly because there's billions of dollars of SoftBank and other uh, big venture capitalists that are putting money in for iBuyers and all kinds of other things. I still think that relationships are going to, you know, and the human touch is not going to replace all these companies that are trying to automate and, um, you know, make the process such like an Amazon checkout. Like the iBuyer is a really good example is that it's like, wow, People are selling to a company that's taking higher fees than an agent, that's giving them a lower price than regular market. And by the way, they don't really have any interest in that customer either. <laughs> you know, they, they're really there to make profit off their back. And the customer, let's say the seller that's going to work with that iBuyer, willingly goes into the situation knowing that this company is trying to make money off me. They're going to charge more and pay less. And, it's, and nobody's got my back. And I think it's interesting that that Wall Street has come in to take the American dream in a few ways through iBuyers. You know, when you look at companies like Blackstone that bought up thousands and thousands and thousands of properties after the recession, like institutions are starting to hold real estate now, which I think is a threat to the American dream. Um, I don't think that that's going away, but I think it's something that people, I wish that there was a little bit more collective awareness about what's really happening with some of these situations because 
Wall Street's trying to own your house. And I think that that's a problem. You know, they're trying to make money off of every American at this point, off of the greatest financial asset they'll probably ever have, taking advantage of that. And in literally the people, that 1% is going to be the ones that can make all the money. Yeah. And, and one of the craziest things about it is the Wall Street figure out a way to make money by taking no risk because the majority of the risk of owning real estate is holding it, mm -hmm. you know, because you don't know what the market's going to do. So every person, every American that's ever bought a piece of real estate is assuming a significant level on, of risk because we can't predict what's going to happen in the future. Well, they're coming after the fact, after this person has, you know, has built up their equity on their home by taking that risk and taking profit from the risk taken by the homeowner. Mm -hmm. It is completely bonkers. You know, y y the bottom line is this. If you, if on the, you know, shop local day or whatever, you go to the local coffee shop and you, you know, you like to shop in a local boutique because you don't want to give money to this, you know, greedy corporate, you know, world, don't sell your home to an iPad. Because th mm -hmm. that's also the part of this equation the problem is all this stuff is so big that's impossible to calculate mm -hmm. meaningfully. But if you're moving a thousand homes in a local market, meaning you are provide you're buying it from the person and then you're selling it and taking the profits and hightailing out of town, you're funneling money away from the economy from this mm -hmm. town in not not a small way. If you did did it with five homes, no big deal. If you do it with a, with a thousand homes, that's a problem. That's mm -hmm. a problem. That's a thousand. You know, if you're going to sell a thousand homes, that's a thousand real estate commissions that didn't get paid. That's possibly a thousand title um, company transactions that didn't take place locally that are taking place in some title company elsewhere. There's a lot of moving parts in a real estate transaction that are not that that when you're working with the I buyers are not happening at a local level, which in turn, it's not it's not affecting the pocket of the seller in any positive way. If anything, the opposite, it's taking money away from their pocket. But additionally, it's taking it funneling money away from the local economy in, in, in a big part, in a big, big part. Mm -hmm. Well, I think part of the reason that all of this is even able to happen, well, two things. One is that for the first time, like over the last like five years or so, money is being thrown into real estate like it is into tech companies where it's like, okay, we'll, we'll have a loss for 10 years, but it'll make up for the long run. It's that Uber and Netflix and Amazon mentality. Let's price out the competition. And then later on, we can shift and adjust any way we want because then there won't be competition anymore. And, there, and these companies are operating at losses, but it doesn't matter because they have billions of dollars in the bank to float them and they can make a lot of mistakes or they can underprice uh, the, the market uh, in, until they're the only last one standing. And I think that's that's the objective. I mean, that's exactly how Amazon operated. Similar thing. Yes, we love the convenience of Amazon, but it is taken from local retailers a lot. You know, they're going yeah. out of business and retail is a whole different world now than it was 10 years ago because Amazon is taking profits from every local place. Yeah, the country. malls are closed. Malls yeah. are a thing of the past. And, you know, I was trying to think of what, what would be a good analogy because there is a thought that popped into my head a couple of weeks ago and is, we assume as, you know, our human condition that technology is always a good thing. Like we associate technology with the invention of the wheel with, you know, creating fire for the first time. Like the technology has always propelled us forward. But I would argue there is, we've reached a critical mass specifically in our industry with technology where they've figured out that people generally think technology moves us forward but the problem is, in, in the specific space, the people that control technology, I don't think they're any longer responding to the consumer demands. I think what they're doing now is sort of equivalent to the roads in a neighborhood. Well, you know, you build a lot of roads because that, that would be technology. You, you're building a lot of roads because you're making it convenient for everybody closing a bunch of roads so that everybody goes through the same one and saying, look, everybody goes through this one. It must be the best one that th that's that's playing dirty games. And I think that's a lot of what they're doing. They're not responding to consumer demands. They're forcing the consumer into these avenues by deceptive marketing and a host of other things that, that I've talked about at length in the podcast. 
that are making people having to go through these avenues that they would probably otherwise not go through. So it's not a response to consumer demands. It's literally a, they're dictating with technology where the consumer goes because they control those funnels that you're speaking of. Like, w- you know, when you're in Google, it's not a democratic system who comes up ranked up, up top in the searches. You know, if somebody posted like, you know, selling home in Winter Garden, best real estate agent in Winter Garden, and three I buyers pop up first. Mm-hmm. That's not what that person was looking for, but that's very likely what would happen in that specific scenario. That is, a, is sort of a, a, a points to what I'm talking about: technology not being there to respond to the consumer's demand, but sort of to funnel people into avenues that they really wouldn't have gone down otherwise. Yeah, I, you know, a couple things I feel like. You know, what's the, what does everybody say? You probably have a friend like every week or two that's like, I'm going to go get my real estate license. You know, I mean, it's to the point where it's a joke now. Um, but <clears throat> I feel like the reason that iBuyers can exist and in discount brokerages and all this kind of stuff, because there's so many realtors that have charged full commission, whatever you consider that to be, and they do a horrible job. And then that person's so disenchanted. They're like, I'm never going to hire a realtor again, or this, my realtor screwed up so bad. And, you know, if there was a bunch of a, a class A realtors going around, these iBuyers wouldn't be as, and discount brokerages and other things wouldn't be as much of a threat, but they really can be because so many realtors have ruined the reputation of realtors. And now, now collectively we have to figure out how to overcome that and say, no, we are the best alternative. We do have your back, you know, but you have to have class A realtors doing that because the 80% are going to continue reinforcing this belief that realtors, you know, that they're not worth their weight, that you can go all, you can go alternative routes. I mean, some people selling their house have more experience than their listing agent in selling houses. You know, that's completely wrong and everybody's got to start somewhere. But when there's that many people running amok in our industry, I think they're allowing all of these situations to happen with iBuyers and, you know, discount brokerages and that sort of thing. 100%, 100%. There's two problems the one that you just pointed to, probably one of the biggest ones, if not the biggest one, which is the sheer number of agents that enter the industry. And that I don't have a problem with agents entering the industry. What I have a problem with is a system that allows brokers to be basically absent brokers Mm -hmm. to people that don't know what they're doing. And so you have a big number of agents on the street working with customers that have no business doing so because they've never seen a purchase contract their entire life, but they're out there and they're permitted to do business. And the brokers have a genuine incentive to hire these people and set them on the street because of the gym membership model that we talked earlier, because that agent's paying a $59 or $69 or $100 monthly fee to that office because that agent leaves a part of their commission if and when they sell a house some of their you know a large chunk of their commission stays in the brokerage so the brokers are running a business you know and i say this sometimes is in a perfect world you want the consumer's needs and the agent's needs and the broker's needs to all always you know be on top of each other and overlap but that's not always the case and more often than not, I think what happens lately is the broker's needs go in a completely different direction. And the agents are either they're not um, nuanced enough or their critical chip thinking, the, the critical thinking chip has been deactivated. So they don't even think about this stuff. They don't understand that, the, that those two things don't talk to each other. Like your broker's best interest are not always your best interest. And they're certainly not always the consumer's best interest. And if you want to stay in this for the long run, you got to side with the consumer. You got to, mm-hmm. again, you got to go with, with the demands that the consumers are looking for. Um, and, and it doesn't seem to always be the case when you have, you know, I think the last statistic that I saw was like 47% of agents in the United States belong to a large franchise, to a national franchise brokerage. And you have national franchises focused on recruiting from each other, so trying to outdo Mm -hmm. each other for agent count. The iBuyers are having a party over there because the iBuyers, I I truly believe, and this is my personal belief, that they make a, a, a calculation that as so long as these guys are competing for agent count and taking agents from each other, they're going to be able to flourish mm-hmm. because you're not going to have those big figureheads of those companies sounding the alarm of the iBuyers. In fact, most of those guys 
are trying to get in bed with the eye buyers because they see that as additional value to their agents, which that's a totally other bonkers proposition as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. Well, the other thing too that you're making me think of is that the if there was one massive entity that should have our backs and be on the same level as everybody else is National Association of Realtors. And it's crickets. Like they're not doing anything about anything. And, you know, that's like everybody has money to make the state wants as many application fees that you know as they can get the realtor associations want to make as much money through membership then the brokers want to make as much money as they can and it's you know it's just really unfortunate that that's kind of the way that it, the world works everybody's just trying to make a dollar but when when you look at you know we have there are huge companies like zillow and open door and even private real estate companies that are kind of threatening the institution a little bit too and then our National Association of Realtors is doing nothing. I mean, it's just there's no talk about anything to help combat all of these disruptions. And, you know, and that's and meanwhile, like you said, realtors are fighting realtors because there is not a, a larger support out there to help compete against some of these companies. You know, it's like I think the best example is that Realtor.com is so anti-realtor. <laughs> it is. And it's kind of anti-consumer, too, um, because you know, we put our listings on there and then we don't even get those buyer calls unless we pay them a boatload of money. They're doing the exact same thing Zillow is, which is harming realtors. And, um, and I realize that realtor.com is not actually managed by the national association of realtors, but it's a really good example of, well, who's got our back. You know, it's like, there should be a platform that's, a, that's realtor friendly, that, that they, and they should be on a national level providing uh, tools and resources or really just probably a competitive nature that actually competes against the Zillows of the world because they there, if there's one entity that could do it, well, <laughs> that had the clout and the influence and all of that to do it, it would be the national association of realtors. I don't, they're, um, you know, unfortunately they're not technically a monopoly cause they're an association, but they're basically a monopoly from the way that you have to be join them to be a realtor to that's how you get the MLS access. They don't have to compete for anything. They, well, they haven't in like a hundred years. I think it's going to start changing now where, if they don't get it together, the word realtor is going to get replaced as well. I mean, I think it might be a few decades before that happens, but I think even that fundamental institution is being threatened because realtors are not happy with what they get from a local state or national level. They're, it's literally just the brokerage mentality. It's, uh, you know, I'm going to hang my license here by agent. Hopefully you never talk to me again. That's most brokers mentality. And the associations are the same thing. Come pay us our fees and then go, hopefully back to your full-time job or whatever, you know, right. which is not real estate in a lot of cases. And, I've, and it's just a shame because I feel like if there's, if there was one uh, entity that should be on the forefront, it would be the one that's actually probably furthest behind. Yeah. I mean, I, I like to give the devil its due. And, and what I would say just sort of a, a, as a counterpoint is we happen to be in Orlando, Florida, which is one of, it is everybody's hot spot for testing new stuff. So when mm -hmm. iBuyers launch, they like to launch in Orlando, Florida. When new tech companies launches a new lead program, they like to launch in Orlando, Florida. There's something about Mickey Mouse, man, that people love to come mm -hmm. to our town and test things out. I think it has to do because of the melting pot that is, or that, that, that is Central Florida, that it's a good sort of micro cosmo of the entire country. But... What happens, I think, a lot of times with a national association is people in a, most people in most of the United States right now have never heard of an iBuyer. Mm -hmm. Agreed. And so it's problematic in the sense that we are here in Orlando or in Phoenix or in Dallas and we're like, hey, help, help, give us a hand. We, we need your help. And they are like, eh, do you? I don't know. Never heard of you guys. Never heard of this iBuyer guys. Small company. Or nothing. We, you know, we are in 52 states. They're in six. Yeah, I don't think they're not going to last. And so I agree with you that it's a it's sort of a myopic point of view because when you when we're looking at things and we're looking at how things scale, you know, you know, this stuff has a, a, the scaling of technology most often works in a multiplier level, meaning like, you know, the they, they go through a slow rise, but then eventually that curve gets really steep when the multiplier effect really takes, you know, takes a hold of things. So I, I can provide more excuse for the National Association than I can 
to the local offices and the local brokerages and the franchises. Like, if you're a franchise that has 100,000 agents, you have enough clout. Like, this is what I want to see. I want to see precedent for Remax and Keller Williams and Compass and all these companies together in a Super Bowl ad right before halftime, right before Beyonce goes out there. And I want to see them be like, hey, this is who we are, CEO from such and such companies. Today, we're going to talk to you about iBuyers. Wall Street's trying to buy your house and take your equity. Call one of our agents today to help you protect your equity for a free consultation, even after you've received an offer from them. That's it. Like, mm -hmm. wh what is that going to cost? $2 million in between these guys? They probably spend more than that, than that in a golf vacation every weekend. Like, I think that's who I find sometimes to be even more responsible because they have more touch with the agent. Like the national association is just, it's national. So it's just in the grand scheme of things, when you have chapters in, you know, just within our area, there's three chapters that we can drive to within an hour time and get to. That's pretty crazy. That means there's literally hundreds of this. So the complaints of a few are just not, they're not getting there. Well, uh, but the thing there. is that I feel like every, there should be people that are smart enough there to know what the trends are. Like Wall Street's not pouring tens of billions of dollars into iBuyers just for fun. You know what I mean? Yeah. They have serious end games and NAR should know that. And, you know, it's just like, it's a good example that, you know, Open Door and OfferPad came into, you know, existing a few years ago. And then Zillow, I mean, once they saw it happening, they're like, it's like next version of Zillow. They're like, now we're doing it too. And, the reason is because these are private companies competing against each other and NAR is not a private company. Well, it, you know, they, they don't have to compete against anything right now. So I feel like they're just taking a really relaxed approach to everything. And, you know, it's just one of those things. It's going to catch up so bad. It's going to be like, you know, how the cable companies thought that they were made forever, you know, and people are cutting the cords every day. Um, and I think that it could very much turn into a situation like that where they thought they made it and then they realized that, wow, these other private companies have been moving the needle for years and we haven't been paying attention. Well, there's two things that I think people need to understand this. You know, private companies or public when they're traded mm -hmm. are beholden to their shareholders and their stockholders. And you just got to look at who this company's shareholders and stockholders are and you figure out who they're beholden to. In the case of, you know, the case of Amazon is probably the best one because evidently it is the wildest, biggest success in world history as far mm -hmm. as I'm concerned for a private business. But the way that's happened is they have, they've taken very seriously the responsibility to their shareholder to continue to grow endlessly. There's no mm -hmm. cap to it. There's no cap to where these companies grow. So oftentimes... If you want to figure out that to, if you don't want to believe the intent of a company or if they're telling you an intent that doesn't seem right, all you got to do is kind of close your ears and figure out what's happening around them. And you that gives you a good clue on the intent. And the intent for these companies is to continue to grow. And so I believe them that, like, I believe when Zillow says they don't want to take out the realtor out of the transaction, but I believe there's an asterisk to that. Mm -hmm. So long as that's not the next thing that we need to grow. I think when you get to that point where that becomes the next thing that you need to grow, do I think that they're going to side with us for because we have a 20 year history of, you know, giving them money or are they going to side with their shareholders if they have an opportunity? They're going to side with their shoulders yeah. every time, mm -hmm. every time. Man, there's a lot of change in our industry. Yeah, but I, I think it's good. You know, here, I actually want to share one of my hopes and dreams for the business. Do is it. that. All we've heard is, it's so easy to be in real estate. I'm going to go get in real estate. Like, that's the rhetoric, and it has been for many, many years now. I'm hoping that over the next 10 years or so that the disruptions, the competition is so confusing. And because, um, you know, even as a consumer right now, gosh, there's so many ways to sell your houses and so many commission scenarios and all this stuff. Like, you need representation more than ever right now. And you need somebody that's been in the business and understands all these variables and how they're changing. I really hope in the next decade or so, this industry is harder to survive in so that we can have less agents that are doing better jobs for their customers. There's going to be, I think, uh, 
a premium route that you can go to hire an, a class a realtor and get the best service ever or you're going to just be cheap and probably screw yourself at the end of the day being cheap and getting bad representation i mean there's too much money on the line to risk it to somebody that might not have your best interest in mind like an iBuyer. but i hope in the next 10 years the rhetoric changes to it's hard to be in real estate i would never get in that business do you know how long people or how hard people have to work now to make money and I don't think it'll be really hard for the top agents in the future, but I think that it might be the barrier to entry, but might be more challenging. And I think that that might be the reason, like all these disruptions that everybody's worried about, they might be the reason our industry gets cleaned up too. Um, so I'm really hoping that that's the case because disruption is really good. Like we don't want the world to stand still. We just have to be ready for it. And the people that aren't ready for it aren't good enough to survive in the future. Yeah. And I think, um, I think I think you're right. I think you're right. I think I think that's going to happen because because it's already happening. Because the model of bringing in, you know, 10, 20 new agents every single month knowing that only 3 of them are going to sell a house over the next 12 months was working for a while because they would get access to the MLS and then the board would teach them classes on how to use the MLS. So the brokerage responsibility was sort of minimum. It was a sales meeting, you know, or whatever. But especially, you know, if you need four or five sys to train people on four or five systems to conduct business, then the time spent for training each agent goes up exponentially. And yeah. when that time up continues to go up exponentially, it becomes harder for you to hire, you know, 13 or 14 or 15 out of 20 agents that are never going to sell a house and still tr spend the same amount of time training them. And I think, mm -hmm. you know, to your point, the longer we go on, the more evident that's going to become and the more obvious that's going to become that I think you're going to get to a point where brokerages hopefully get to say, yep, you know, w doors closed. We're not bringing anybody on because... You know, we got to pay a full-time trainer if we're going to bring people on. So, you know, we, we're we just going to have hiring like a month out of the year and then that's it, like a seasonal hire. And that's all we do because because it's not going to be worth their time. That's what I hope anyways. Yeah, well, I mean, I think, you know, at least from our perspective at Mainframe, like we're there. We already realized that, you know, I say this all the time, like when people are trying to build teams or and that sort of stuff, they think, oh, I'm going to go get somebody that has no experience and I'll mold them exactly like I want them to be. But I was like, okay, if 90% of realtors fail in their first year, like nobody should take that gamble. You would never go to the roulette knowing you're going to lose 90% of the time and start throwing your money down. So I think that that's, uh, it's something that we realize in our business is just not worth the risk. Um, cause it, you can spend all that time and money training them and then they go out of business anyway. And then you don't have any ROI on that. Um, but I think that, the the competition for top agents is you know obviously there's people calling them all day long anyway um but it's just a different it's a different world because the companies that have masses of agents are never going to be able to provide high quality services and i feel like that's probably going to be the tipping point for a lot of these top agents where they just realize like i'm not getting what i need because they're dealing with 80 percent all the time um, and, and I hope that changes the way, like what the, the expectations of a brokerage is too, because the agents that have market share should be able to call the shots in terms of what kind of company they want to be at or the vision that they see for the future of the industry and, and make moves accordingly, you know, um, because, because there's a lot of like right now, it's just so easy to get into business. You see title and mortgage and new real estate companies and everybody's trying to like open multiple offices and all this kind of stuff. It's just too easy right now. I feel like we do need a little pinch on the industry, kind of shake everybody up and bring them back to reality. Um, this economic run's been too good for too long, and I think that when some it's gonna have something's gonna adjust eventually, and I think that's gonna be probably the the first step in getting things uh, evened out again because we're definitely at a kind of you know a high flying place right now where everything seems too good to be true. Yeah, if if I had to if I had to th think about this really hard and where I think the changes come from first. I don't know how the national franchise model sticks around. I, I, I just don't, I don't understand how there will be enough agents wanting to give $20,000, $25,000, $30,000 while still paying for monthly fees, while still paying for additional training, while still paying for additional systems. Like, I just don't know who those agents are. 
Well, <clears throat> yeah, because, because totally commission agree. compression is another thing. That's I mean, what I was going to say. Yeah. The, the, the compression of our commissions is a reality. That's not, that's undisputable, m- trackable, measurable. It's commissions have decreased over the years. And it's at a trend that's going to stop probably not in the t- any time in the near future because, by the way, you have so many agents that can provide value. The only thing they have to compete on is I mean, I'll do it for less. Mm-hmm. Less ends up costing you more when someone is not able to negotiate, you know, repairs in your behalf or those repairs out of the contract if you're a seller. But, you know, the, the ostensibly a lot of those agents are just competing on commission, which just compresses it even farther. Right now, the way that is set up is all of the brunt of that compression in the commissions is being absorbed by the agents. The brokerages mm-hmm. don't, if you have a cap, a $20,000 cap in a brokerage, that broker doesn't care if it takes you six houses or 10 houses to cap as long as they get their 20 grand and they get their 20 grand anyway. So um, so I think the next part of the process is going to be if you're an agent and your commission continues to decrease, you're going to say, holy crap, as a figure of percentage of my income, my cost of being in this brokerage is actually going up, which it's bonkers. It's, it's just anti-American as far as I'm concerned that you spend years in a company and the cost as a percentage reflection of your income of being there goes up. It's basically like getting a pay decrease every year. Mm-hmm. It's, it's crazy. Um, I think those agents are going to start either you know, either creating their own outfits and opening their own outfits or going to you know brokerages that can provide them with a proper... Um, value proposition that matches their business or you know something along those lines because this idea that you're going to be paying you know five thousand dollars for a franchise fee when the consumer does not give two shits about what other name is there in the side besides you um, i think that's going to go away i think that's a that's a dying model well and i think that's the reason 100 percent companies are thriving right now gym mentality (laughs) by the hundreds of agents you know um but it makes a uh, makes a lot of sense. Like there's the agents that are hardly getting by in this business, rather than saying, "Hey, maybe I should work harder," or maybe this is not for me. They just think, "Oh, I'm going to go to a cheaper company. I might not get anything, but at least I'll get to keep all my commission, which is not as much as they want it to be." You know, top agents and agents that sell, if you can make so much money in this business, they already know I'm going to have to hire a marketing person, or I'm going to have to hire an assistant. I'm going to have to buy all these systems top agents are willing to spend money because they see it's an investment on their business. And then you have the, the other people that don't sell as much that are ri- so they're pinching pennies all the time, you know, rather than creating a true business for themselves. They're just trying to deal with the fact that they're not doing as well, you know, because people are, there's a lot of people that are hardly making it in this business. Well, and to the, you know, and, and to the credit, I, one thing that I, I, I always like to say is just like, I think real estate agents sort of brought on certain, reputation traits that are less than generous about the industry to themselves brokers didn't do any different Mm -hmm. because the reality is there's quite a bit of 100 percent companies that provide the same exact services out there as the companies charging 20 25 thousand dollar caps to agents Mm -hmm. and so if you're an agent sitting at one of those companies paying 25 grand and you have access to the same exact systems on a hundred percent deal it may not be the best in either case, but it's a net positive as far as I'm concerned. Like you're not giving anything up to go to a hundred percent company. Mm-hmm. How the hell is the people paying twenty five thousand dollars gonna? How is that company gonna survive when enough of those agents realize there is an alternative that might not be as refined as, for example, what you guys offer, but that it provides them the same as the twenty five thousand dollar deal. It's just it's crazy that that even that that's an alternative. Like. You can't go to Lexus and then go get a, the same exact car for a lot less money elsewhere. Like, that's not a thing. Mm-hmm. I can't believe how many agents are at companies with like 80 20 splits or no cap and they're getting zero support, zero services, and they've been there for 10 years. <laughs> it's like, wow, it's so much money to give away if you're not getting value in return. I mean, everything in life, you get what you pay for. And I feel like uh, a lot of agents do need to ask, like, am I actually getting something for these tens of thousands of dollars? Yeah, sometimes. And I think because people think you get what you pay for, people assume sometimes because they're paying a lot of money, they <laughs> they should be getting a lot. It's and, true. and it's part of that hard wiring that we have um, in our mind that, you know, the more we pay must mean that the product is better. And that's, that's just not the case, not in our industry at this time. At Agreed. this point in time, that is just 
it's a fallacy. It's it's just not true in the majority of the time, as far as I can tell. Um, but listen, I, I agree with you 100% in that change is inevitable. The only thing that's constant is change. And and I'm happy there's people like you and like, you know, a lot of the people that I've had on the podcast that, that see the change, recognize it, are ahead of the curve and are saying, you know, bring it on because we have a way to combat, you know, whatever this change looks like. And by the way, we welcome some of this change because we need um, some external force to do a little bit of a house cleanup mm -hmm. in order for us to get as efficient as we truly could be. Because we spend a lot of time right now um, probably trying to overcome objections about things that some other agent did in the past or someone else went through in a previous transaction. Yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Well, I think that's a good spot to wrap it up. Thank you so much, Sean, for um, coming to the podcast today. If someone is listening to this and wants to know more about mainframe real estate, um, how can they do so? I would say um, best thing to do, probably just like shoot us an email and then we'll start a conversation. So like do info at mainframere.com or go to our website, mainframere.com um, and just check us out and contact us through there. Perfect. Thank you so much okay. for coming. Thanks for having me.